us into that discussion as we uh, I almost looked around to look for who the person you're introducing is but I know when we talk about COVID vaccination and this such kind of town hall most of the people online were asking are they going to announce and I've I've met so many people who said we are in the post-COVID era. No, I always love to remind you that we are in the post-lockdown era, but not any information that can be confirmed scientifically or otherwise, but it's been spreading and some people are actually taking it as the gospel truth. Now, those are some of the statements that we want to demystify. Uh, just recently also, the cabinet agreed to vaccination of children and there's been a lot of discussion about some of you saying it's forceful, some of you saying government just just wants to rip off a COVID kind of discussion and, and whatever came through. But I introduce to you our panel. It's a huge panel and I love the comp Let's start off by introducing to you who our panelists are going to be. Number one is, just take a look at this. Dr. Anet Chisache, team leader of immunization vaccine and involvement, national professor officer, routine immunization, World Health Organization, Uganda office. She is a Ugandan medical doctor, public health specialist, with a master's degree from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She has over 10 years of experience in the field of vaccinology. Several publications have been made, currently working with World Health Organization Uganda as a national professional officer for routine immunization and new vaccine introductions. She is also the team lead for immunization vaccine and development team. She is the World Health Organization Liaison Representative on the Uganda National Immunization Technical Advisory Group. She has a vast experience in polio eradication, initiative activities, new vaccination introduction including Ebola vaccine and COVID-19 vaccine among others. Her main role is to provide technical support to the Ministry of Health through the immunization program. Annette provides management, supervision and coordination within the World Health Organization country office to the Immunization Vaccine Department Unit including external counterparts from the unit at the Inter-Country Support Team, Regional Office for Africa and Headquarters. For well, viewers, and they just can't wait to fire some questions. For all the viewers this evening. Ooh, Thank you. That's already encouraging. We have a promise of good news. Mm. Next on our panel is... She obtained a Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery from Macquarie University in 1995. Her Master's of Pediatrics and Child Health in July 2012. She has conducted research among youths with HIV while she was at the Infectious Diseases Institute as a Gilead Fellow and Research Scholar from 2003 to 2011. She received her PhD from the School of Biomedical Sciences at the University of Antwerp in Berlin, involved in fundamental research in a number of pediatric infectious diseases. She is the founder and director of the Makere University College of Sciences Adolescent Health Training Program, as well as the Uganda Society of Adolescent Health. Dr. Chitaka is a committed member of the African Pediatric Society of Infectious Diseases. Definitely not a new face. Many of you have probably disturbed her with a phone call or a message about your children. Doctors for vaccination, mm. please stay there. We are going to let you know exactly why you should take your baby or your child for vaccination. Exactly, because many will be asking what age ranges are we looking at. You said earlier on the kids have better immunity. All those questions are going to be answered. Let's introduce to you our next panelist. Dr. Wanyenze is the Dean of the School of Public Health and a professor in the Department of Disease Control and Environmental Health at Makerere University. Dr. Wanyenze has a vast experience in public health research, capacity building and program management, especially in infectious diseases, sexual and reproductive health and health systems. Dr. Wanyenze has led a wide network of research partnerships with academic institutions and ministries of health in Africa. Dr. Wanyenze is very active in public health policy leadership in Uganda. She has served on various technical committees of the Ministry of Health. She has also served on boards of various organizations in Uganda and globally. She is also a fellow of the Ugandan National Academy of Sciences. She is also a member of the Ministry of Health, COVID-19 Scientific Advisory Committee and Vaccine Advisory Committee. Well, that panelist belongs to advice. This time is coming through. But Professor Wanyenze, say hello to our viewers. 
Thank you, Mildred. Good evening, viewers. I'm glad to be part of this discussion, and please stay there with us. We are happy to answer all your questions. Professor Pontiano Kalebu is the Director of Uganda Virus Research Institute and Director of MRC and LSHTM Uganda Research Unit. He is a Professor of Immunovirology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He holds a medical degree from Macquarie University and a PhD from University of London and now Imperial College. He is a fellow Royal College of Physicians, Edinburgh, a fellow of the Imperial College London, Faculty of Medicine, a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences of United Kingdom and a fellow of the Uganda National Academy of Sciences. His main research interests are viral vaccine research, including understanding protective immune responses, diversity and resistance to antiretroviral drugs. He has co-authored more than 350 publications in scientific journals and book chapters. He sits on many national and international committees, including those of World Health Organization, Africa CDC, USA NIH, and EU EDCTP. He chairs the National COVID-19 Laboratory Quality Assurance Committee and sits on the Ministry of Health COVID-19 Scientific Advisory Committee and Vaccine Advisory Committee. And definitely we'll be asking about some research, about some of the statements that have come through. But Professor, it's a pleasure having you. You can say hello to the viewers. Hello viewers, it's a pleasure to be here and I look forward to the discussions. I can't wait as well for the questions to be answered. And last but not least on our panel is... Dr. Diana Atwine Kanzira is the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Health of the Republic of Uganda. In this role, she is in charge with the technical, leadership as well as stewardship of all financial resources at the Ministry. She is currently focused on introducing reforms in culture ethics and values in the sector, which she believes will increase quality and access to health care. She is a staunch crusader against corruption in the health sector. Dr. Twine is a physician specialist in internal medicine with a postgraduate in project planning and management. Additionally, she undertook a course in improving the quality of health services from Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She has a rich experience in international clinical trials and bioethics, especially in HIV AIDS. Dr. Twine is the former director of Health Monitoring Unit under State House, whose role is to ensure a responsive and accountable national healthcare system through access to care. She is a strong advocate for integrity, transparency, and results oriented performance. any person who I mean a person who exhibited passion for the kind of um, a job that they do at the time when everyone feared to come out and speak out candidly about what was happening in the country that was and is still Dr. Diana Twine a very good evening to you say hello to our viewers as well um, hello everyone uh, thank you very much for joining us please stay tuned for all the questions to be answered thank you very much and of course, the questions definitely start at this particular point in time. But using the hashtag uh, vaccination UG and uh, also hashtag vaccines work, we will be able to take in any of your questions as they do come through. And uh, my colleague Ben Mwine will also be handling any questions that will be coming in from the public, part of the members who are part with us here. I know many of you are following up from TV. We have a few who are following with us here uh, live at the next conference center, at Next Media Park, Plot 13, Nagoro Summit View. And we'll be taking in all those questions, make sure that they continue streaming in. Bukeda Television, Baba Television, as well as Urban TV, thank you so much for as well joining us in this particular discussion. But of course, I would like to start off with Dr. Twine. Um, when someone gets to see us seated like this, talking about COVID and vaccination, their hearts are literally pumping at the fastest rate. Some are expecting some announcements that they're not sure about. But what's the current status in the country uh, with regard to COVID? Because some still think we are post-COVID or COVID is done since we entirely now have uh, we had the full reopening of the economy earlier on in January this year. Uh, it, it is true that many people think that uh, COVID has gone. COVID is still with us. COVID comes in waves. 
as you know that we, in the last two years we got three waves but now we still have many cases in the country and therefore we, we don't want uh, people to put down the, the guards they need to know that the, vac the vaccine is the only answer mm. uh, COVID is going to be here with us it, will, it, is, it has come like influenza and other diseases that, that, that come but what we know and what is the answer for now is to make sure that we are protected through vaccination. Okay. Any more changes that could be coming through? Because we've so far seen some other countries that have already started announcing once again, um, for example, mandatory wearing of masks in public and, and all the other SOPs that we used earlier on. It is, it is very important that we maintain the SOPs, um, especially the, the ones that we are very sure that protect like putting on masks, uh, sanitizing, and also um, avoiding um, the crowd, especially when we have high numbers. When the country is going through a wave, you know that there's a higher chance that you'll meet someone who is, who is, who is sick. So mm -hmm. the best is to, to prevent um, through SOPs, but also to make sure that um, we are covered through uh, vaccination. Okay. Just before we go to any of the other panelists, uh, you talked about vaccination, and, and definitely I agree, vaccines work. I have taken my jabs and my booster, and if there is any other chance to take another booster, it is okay. It is better to save my life than, you know, listen to all the hoax messages that are coming through. But, but Dr. Atwine, where is our stand? Where are we currently with regard to the numbers on vaccination in the country? Because I know that is part of what we hinged on to be able to reopen the country, even the schools themselves, where we ask the teachers to be vaccinated vaccinated and all the other essential staff do we have those numbers at hand are we doing good um at the beginning you know that we targeted to cover 22 um million mm. and these were the age of 18 uh, upwards but then later we we had to revise our statistics because we also wanted to include the children uh, from 12 and uh, up to 17 or up to 18 and so that number increased but I, as we stand now uh, for, the, for those that have received the first dose we are talking about about 70 percent mm. uh, those that have received full vaccination we're talking about between 55 to 60 percent um, so we, we, we want to say that we have not reached a hundred percent and that's why we, we are here. That's why we, we, we want to rally everyone who has not been vaccinated to get vaccinated, but also those that have not completed the second dose because there is benefit to complete that dose, but also to, to, to get jabbed. Okay. So we, we haven't reached 100% of our targeted population. Oh. And, and, and therefore, this, that's the reason we must ensure that we observe SOPs, but also make sure that we encourage people to go and get vaccinated. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Atwine. Professor Kalebu, um, COVID-19 brought the world to a standstill, never unprecedented that we even see the aviation industry come to a halt and everyone is under lockdown and we're just okay with it because everyone believed that that is where we needed to be. But we've known that over a period of time, vaccine manufacturing or development takes quite a long time period and yet for COVID-19 just months after we saw a vaccine come out and, and 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 one would ask how effective is this rushed vaccine and I would quote rushed vaccine that's a very interesting question and in fact it one of it's one of the causes of the hesitancy mm. people question how could you we have been telling people vaccines take 10 years 15 years mm -hmm. but you make a vaccine in one year I think it was a surprise. It was a surprise to many, but even scientists, it was really a triumph for science. But there are a number of reasons for this success. Mm. I think the technology that was used, we need to know, was not new technology in most cases. It's technology that had been used or platforms that had been used for other diseases, HIV, they have tried it in malaria, TB. So they used that really, the new technology, to advance the COVID vaccine very quickly. Okay. But 
there was also a lot of working together, partnerships. You remember Operation Warp Speed, bringing together public, private, everyone coming together. For the Moderna vaccine, for instance, one of my colleagues who was working in Vaccine Research Center was one of those who designed it. Mm. He had been working on HIV for a long time to try to design the HIV vaccine. It was complicated, but he was able to use that technology, provide it to Moderna, and they had a vaccine. So that was very quick, working together. The investments, in, eight, in 11 months, they invested 85 billion US dollars. Oh. And for HIV in 20 years, they had invested 15 billion. So you can see such a difference. Yeah. 85 billion US dollars in just 18 months. But also, the uh, platforms or the systems that were used for other diseases, very quick to conduct vaccine trials using the systems, the platforms for HIV, those who have been working in HIV vaccine, H uh, uh, HVTN, HPTN, all those were used, that mm. helps to accelerate. Mm. Then they also did parallel studies, very quickly. Very quickly, you are in the lab, you go into the animals, phase one, as you are finishing phase one, the results are appearing promising, you go to phase two, phase three, very quickly. Not staggering as we have done for other diseases. But I also want to tell you that <clears throat> people have been asking me, but how come for HIV it has taken a long time? Mm -hmm. The viruses are also different. We are dealing with different viruses. If you get COVID, m most of you recover. People recover. Yeah. In fact, many people remain asymptomatic, but they have been infected. The immune system can work on the virus. Mm. So you use that to develop a vaccine. You use what nature, what God has, uh, God has made to develop a vaccine. But for HIV, nobody recovers. We don't understand how HIV is protected. TB is another complicated one. Yeah. Many other diseases. So also the viruses were different. It was a little bit easier for the uh, SARS-CoV-2 than for some of the other complicated viruses. Okay. So that one also helped. So there were a number of reasons why. But also during trials. COVID, when it comes, many people get infected. And you want that if you want to do what we call efficacy trials. You want many endpoints, many people to get infected to see whether the vaccine works. Very quickly, you can evaluate your vaccine. And like other diseases like TB, HIV, which takes longer, getting these events takes, uh, takes longer. So there were a number of those issues. But indeed, it was very fast. But mm -hmm. I can't, I want to assure everyone that it went through the right processes okay. for them lab, to the animals, phase one, up to the third phase. One out there is still, the, the doubting Thomases are still saying, for example, um, Reeds indicates that in 2015, there was a World Health Organization world, um, white paper, which indicated that the next epidemic would be coming through, and the virologists were quick to predict that it would be of a viral origin, right? And, and, and one would ask then, if we knew... The Baganda have a saying, So if we knew there is something that was coming, why did we panic? Why did we go on a standstill? And yet this was actually something that was predicted. In fact, because of that prediction, it's one of the reasons that we were able to do better with this SARS-CoV-2. If we're not prepared, including in our country here, mm. yeah, the public emergency operating center, all that we have done, the ministry to prepare for emergencies was very helpful in addressing this. If that wasn't there, it would have been worse. So indeed, you're right. The scientists and the world has been on the alert that the next pandemic will be a virus, but we need to be prepared. And indeed, that is one of the reasons. You remember when we had Ebola in West, Nile, in, in West Africa. Yeah. Again, different organizations came together to create for instance, what they call CEPI, uh, that is making vaccines. Every company, public, private, even this time for Ebola, such organizations like CEPI were very, very helpful in really funding, bringing ideas together to really address COVID. So indeed, our preparedness, our predictions did help 
to address COVID. Okay. Professor Roda, um, Dr. Kalebo has just talked about um, the vaccines and, and, and that we had existing technology, and that was great that it came through quite quicker because we don't know where we would be today. But, but one then would ask, um, I, am, I was vaccinated against polio. I didn't get it against measles, the six killer diseases. Now I don't know how many they are. I didn't get them. I am vaccinated against COVID, and I still get it. So one would ask, is it effective or is it better that I will contract COVID, get my natural immunity and leave this whole idea of vaccination? Thank you, uh, Mildred. And another very important question. So, um, so when we get the vaccination uh, against uh, Paul, uh, rather, uh, COVID, um, we, we do help our body uh, to build immunity, uh, okay. as, do, as uh, Professor Ponciano has said. And... Uh, or call it uh, proteins or whatever, but it's a protective mechanism of the body that is accelerated by the vaccine. Mm. And it works in two ways. It could stop the infection, uh, so you don't get infected with uh, COVID, but it's even more effective in terms of moderating the disease. So you might get infected, but then you don't get very severe forms of disease. It could just be very mild and you're off to work um, mm -hmm. and, and, and healthy in a few days. On the other hand, if you don't have the, that protection at all, then you could end up getting very severe disease and even die. So, so it does reduce the chances of infection, but especially does reduce um, the, the severity of the disease and protects mm -hmm. us. So in that sense, it actually does um, uh, work well. It is effective, and we should actually use it. The infection, like you said, uh, can also, you know, help uh, to, to develop immunity, but it might not be as efficient uh, uh, as it were uh, because we, we, we know, yes, it can protect, but at the same time, you're also risking getting the complications of the disease, uh, which are a lot more severe uh, than the vaccine. Uh, so, so you choose a more complicated route of getting your immunity when you could actually do it in a better way by using a vaccine which has been tested, whose, whose dose we know, whose frequency we know, okay. and, uh, and whose side effects we also know are really much, much more mild than um, you would from natural uh, infection. But, but, but doctor, you've talked about, the, okay, it is effective, thank you for preaching the gospel, then why are you asking me to do a booster just about six months after? So, um, so vaccines are different. There are those vaccines you will take and you don't have to keep, you know, uh, uh, repeating all the time mm. uh, to be able to maintain a sufficient level of immunity to protect you all through. But there are those also we know where the immunity wanes off after some time. We know that that happens for the influenza viruses, for example. So you okay. take it, but after about 12 months, your, you know, your immunity is coming down. And then you need a booster to help reactivate your body so that that protection is maintained. So as it were, we are seeing now that for COVID, uh, uh, we, we are perhaps going the same pattern as it is with the influenza. Of course, there are more studies that are going on, but right now it's very clear that the immunity does come down okay. and we need that booster to be able to keep uh, ourselves uh, protected. How many we will need eventually is still an area that, that we are still studying as the vaccine is rolled out in the uh, communities and we continue to study and, and, and we'll certainly be able to uh, share that information as well when it becomes available. All right, something burning I know out of someone there who says, huh, are we going to boost until God comes back? <laughs> but that's a discussion that we'll be getting into just in a bit much later on. Dr. Sabrina. The mothers out there are already scared. The parents, not only the mothers, but of course the mothers got affected the, the most. When cabinet came out and agreed that there is going to be vaccination of children, and then there are reports of forceful vaccination. You know, our schools, they will say, I mean, you get vaccinated or you do not bring your child to school. Why are we having this conversation when earlier on the discussion was all the children have better immunity, you know, than us, the adults? Uh, thank you, Mildred. And that's also a very interesting question. The truth is, government cannot forcefully immunize any child. That okay. is not true. We recently had a statement from the Minister of Health who reaffirmed and said government cannot forcefully 
vaccinate a child. Okay. If you know, as adults, when we were first vaccinated in <clears throat> March of 2021, yes, we consented. And so, how would anyone think that government will go and start vaccinating? As pediatricians would be the first ones to riot, wouldn't we? <laughs> we would. We would. No one is going to vaccinate a child by force. But the matter, the, the crux of the matter is children also need vaccinations. Children are the majority in our country. 55% yeah. of our population is less than 18 years. Yeah. And so for me the fear is if the child is not vaccinated, like you heard Professor Roda saying, we don't know what kind of COVID infection they are going to get. And so there's always that fear. When we learned that Pfizer vaccine was safe, it's being given to American children. Okay. We were waiting and waiting for when Ugandan children would also get the benefit of that vaccine. Long COVID is real. And when you're kissed by COVID, we don't know how you're going to respond. Yeah. We don't know if it's going to be serious or if it's going to be disastrous. We do not know. So vaccinating a child is actually helpful. So parents are going to be given the liberty to peacefully take their children for vaccination. I am one of those 300,000 parents who have already got our children vaccinated. Okay. But, but Dr. Sabrina, the mm. first discussion in the beginning was that the children actually have better immunity, mm -hmm. you know, to, to fight off the COVID mm -hmm. um, without getting vaccinated. And also when we talk about what, what has changed, that's number one. So, and and, and mm. secondly also, when we talk about force, it is not like someone is going to come and get the jab. To you know, like how they vaccinate. It could be literal force. <laughs> like the school says, you either vaccinate or don't bring your child. Actually, the truth is, if in, in some places that can happen, mm. but not here. There's negotiation. There's, there's understanding. And what has changed is the fact that children are actually becoming sick. There's data to show that, you know, 100 children who are admitted and critically ill, 10 of those children died. Mm. And all over the world we know that some children are actually dying from COVID-19 infection. Okay. So, as the world revolves, as this unprecedented new virus changes and keeps changing, and it started with the Alpha variant, mm. and now as Professor Kalebo will tell you, we have the Omicron variant, and it's not the B1 1.2, it's now the B1 1.5. And who knows if it's going to become B1.1.x? 1. 1. We do not know. So as things keep changing, we wouldn't like to leave the children behind. Okay. It reminds me of those days when HIV was rife and parents were the ones rushing to treat themselves for HIV. Yeah. And the poor children were being left behind and they were dying. So in terms of equity and in terms of equality in healthcare provision, we think that children also need the benefit of the doubt okay. to get the vaccine. All right. Thank you. Doctor, I'll be coming back to you. Let me go to Dr. Annette. Uh, Dr. Sabrina, for example, pointed out Pfizer vaccine, safe and has been used on children in America. And we know we have Moderna, you have Pfizer, you have AstraZeneca, you have Johnson & Johnson. It, 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 it is a cocktail of these vaccines. And one is asking, number one, are they all safe? Do they work the same way? What, what's with this differentiation amongst the vaccines? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, that was a question asked in March 2021 mm. when we introduced the vaccine in Uganda. Are these vaccines safe? And as already mentioned by Professor, people are raising questions. The rush. Are we sure you're going to be safe? Now, let me first give a quick background. Vaccines are drugs. Okay. Okay. Now, there's no drug which is 100% safe. So even the vaccines are You can not say that again, doctor, <laughs> and we get scared the morning. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not scaring. There's no drug that is 100% safe. Okay. Even for the vaccines. Mm. Let me give a quick example during the COVID, the second wave. Mm. People took a lot of vitamin C. Yes. And they developed side effects. And it's a drug. It's a very simple drug, by the way, yeah. vitamin C. So yeah. even the vaccines are not entirely 100% safe. But 
there are side effects that were detected during the phases of the clinical trial, as explained by Professor Caleb. And those are mild symptoms. And what we need to know is that I may develop a fever, I may develop some joint pains, I may develop some backache, I might even fail to wake up in the morning after receiving a jab. Mm. But within 24, 48 hours, 72 hours, I'm okay. And it has been documented. So we shouldn't get so worried about the side effects. And secondly, even a side effect is basically an indicator that the vaccine is working. Okay? okay. The vaccine okay. is working. Your body is now in the body. It's fighting. It's, it's already now <clears throat> producing the army to fight that virus in case you get in touch with it. So I'd like to encourage and even tell the viewers this evening that the COVID-19 vaccines are safe. We have those common, I use the word common side effects, okay. the fevers. Now, there are even rare side effects that are usually detected when we vaccinate millions and millions of people. All right. And rare, it means basically one client can pop up out of the very many million doses that you've actually administered. But the question we ask ourselves, if that one case occurs, can it be managed? Can it be treated? Okay. If we can treat that case, then fine. That benefits outweigh the risks. What do we mean? That out of these 100 million people who have been vaccinated, one of them has got this side effect, but the 999,000 are already protected against the disease. But even this one client, if she survives, will also be already protected against that disease. So I would like to encourage that vaccines are very safe. And the current vaccines used in this country have been approved by World Health Organization yeah. and endorsed by the National Drug Authority. Okay. But monitoring of all the side effects is ongoing. All the medical concerns, let me use the word medical concerns, not side effects, but if anyone has any medical concern, he or she should report immediately to the National Drug Authority so that okay. action can be taken. But beyond that, even sick decay, then the thing gets worse, and then the following day, even the person passes on. But by the time we investigate, it was something else, but was linking this illness to the vaccine. Yet this person already had another <coughs> disease, or was already incubating something, and then it popped up. Okay. So that is what I'm saying. The vaccines are very safe. So, so one would ask, do all the vaccines, boost, I'll say I'll take J&J, <laughs> do they work the same way, and can I do this mix and match? Yes. Now, back still to history, March 2021, when we launched the vaccine, we're insisting if you've started with AstraZeneca's dose one, continue using AstraZeneca's mm -hmm. dose two. But the scientists were not sleeping. They're working 24-7 because we have over 200 vaccines under the different phases of clinical trial. Okay. So far, only 10 have been approved by WHO. But remember, we're supposed to vaccinate billions and billions of people. So the scientists went ahead to say, no, no, let us find out. Can I receive AstraZeneca? And then second dose, I receive Pfizer? And the answer is yes. The results have proved to be very good that you can mix. And now currently that the studies is AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson. If you receive dose one AstraZeneca, mm. you can receive your second dose as Pfizer or Moderna. Okay. to complete, to be fully vaccinated. If I receive Pfizer as my dose one, or Moderna as my dose one, I can receive AstraZeneca as my dose two, or even Johnson & Johnson to complete, to be fully vaccinated. Sinopharm and Sinovac. If I receive dose one or Sinopharm, dose uh, or one, I can receive either AstraZeneca, or Johnson & Johnson, or Pfizer, or Moderna. So you see, studies have been done and it's have even been found to be once you do that mix and match, yeah. if the immune response is much better than receiving the same vaccine. The side effects, because I know people raise an issue of the side effects. The side effects are similar to whether you receive AstraZeneca or whether you receive the Pfizer vaccine. So if any product is available when a client reports the vaccination center, yeah. And the health worker tells you that I have this to enable you to complete. Please just go ahead and accept whatever product is available because they all have the same result. Okay. Protecting us against dying 
and again it's rushing for oxygen mm. remember during the third wave we're all trying yes. to look around for oxygen cylinders yeah. because they all have the same end result all right thank you very much dr Ned. maybe i'd like to come back to dr sabrina just for clarity when we said children and vaccination mm -hmm. i am carrying my one month baby that's a child mm -hmm. i have a 16 year old that's a child mm -hmm. so do we have a particular age group that we are targeting of children who could be vaccinated or is it going to be throughout as long as you drop on earth day one you're a mm -hmm. child you can't be vaccinated i i like that and it's it's not true that um the Ministry of Health and the government of Uganda is trying to vaccinate newborn babies. Okay. No, it's 12 years to 17 years. Oh, okay. And that is what has been recommended. However, I'd like to reassure the public and say that pregnant women are vaccinated and their babies in utero are safe. So that gives us confidence to know that even babies in utero, when the mom receives the vaccine, the, mom, the baby is safe. Okay. We know that recently the CDC in the U.S. has started to vaccinate children as young as two months. Wow. And there's a huge drive ongoing as we speak for children to get those safe and needed vaccines. Okay. Mm. Let me come to Dr. Atwine. When we talk about vaccines, we're talking about issues, medi uh, medicine or medical field. It is a service, but there is a business to it. And, and the president has also continuously, and that is why he continues to, to talk about scientists and they're going to solve our problems, uh, looking at the economic aspect of sciences. Now, the people who are saying, and, and this has come through, that one, you are, and, and when I say you, the medics, you are announcing waves because you want to cash in on that. You want to keep us um, vaccinating all the other time because there is someone who is cashing in on whichever vaccine is bought because this is manufactured. How could you help such a person? Because there is a truth to it, because there is someone who is catching in on whichever vaccine is sold, after all. For the manufacturers, yes, it is a business. But also it is answering a question, a global question, a health question. Mm. But for us as the sector, as the Ministry of Health and as government, it is about protection of lives because that is our cardinal mandate. Our cardinal mandate is to make sure that we, we educate, we provide all the information to the public, we provide the services, and one of those services is to make sure that we avail the vaccines, and, and, and also we go out and provide these services to the people. So it, it has nothing to do with with the, the, the business on our side. Okay. Yes, it is true that some people think that um, <clears throat> when we say there is COVID and you know, that means that is money, but I, I, th I think our responsibility, it is about providing the right information, the accurate information, and we, pro we go ahead and provide the services that, we safeguard, that will safeguard the, 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 the lives of the people. Okay. So I just want to to assure the listeners that, that this is our mandate. So if we sat back and did nothing, then that will not be our, 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 our calling, our purpose, our goal, and objective as a sector. Okay. So that's why even we are seated here right now trying to provide this information to bring more reassurance to the public that government of Uganda, Ministry of Health, is committed together with partners to make sure that we provide the services that the people need and we provide all the information that the public needs. Thank you, Doctor. Let me come back to Dr. Kalebo here. Um, out of all the vaccines that we've so far gotten, I know that the Parliament appropriated amounts of money for vaccine purchase. We waited until we could wait uh, no more. And then we started seeing donations come through. Um, number one, one would ask, why is Africa almost entirely depending on donations and then there's been the whole discussion about these donations coming in towards expired debt so it's more like they're dumping the western world is dumping to the african countries i think covid has given us a big lesson that africa we need to pull up the reason we got donations vaccines from elsewhere because we didn't have the capacity to produce the vaccines the disease was with us we could not just look 
so we had vac to get vaccines from elsewhere. And of course, the whole world was also looking, they prepared themselves that in case vaccines become available, how do they reach the low and middle income countries? COVAX was set up, mm. different uh, countries and different uh, uh, organizations to help resources, poor resources, so that the vaccines become available. So the main reason why we got vaccines from elsewhere, because we didn't have them, we didn't have the capacity. It's only recently that some countries in Africa have started making some COVID vaccines, South Africa, uh, recently. So that was really a major, major, a major problem. And that has changed, is changing our thinking, how can we do better? Even here in Uganda, you hear the president and everyone urging how can Africa uh, do better? So that was really a major, major driving force, the lack of uh, uh, the capacity. And as you saw, you rightly say, said it, Sometimes they were giving us even what is left, <laughs> leftovers, mm. yeah? leftovers. The vaccines started trickling in. COVAX nearly failed because even the vaccines you had, they tried to get AstraZeneca. Then countries started buying everything for themselves. Mm. And when big pro pro uh, problem until afterwards and the don donations uh, started coming, on, coming in. So that was a major, major problem. But you talk about donations. Yeah, uh, donations came in different ways, uh, of the, uh, COVAX and other countries, but also the government, the PS will tell you, we are beginning to buy even using our, our own resources. Mm -hmm. So moving forward, it's a lesson. How can we develop capacity so that in the future, when we have these pandemics, Africa can also be at the forefront and uh, we are not left behind. All, all right, thank you very much. Let me get back to um, Professor Roda. You talked about the vaccine, its efficiency, and that we need to get a booster. And then someone is asking, are we going to boost up until Jesus returns? Every other six months, go for a booster. Every other six months, go for a booster. What, what is this? Um, so in terms of are we going to boost forever, uh, we are still uh, uh, following uh, research that's going on and also how the vaccine works uh, when we begin to use it, uh, following up people that um, have been vaccinated to see how long they can maintain that protection. And um, it's possible that we might need to eventually boost annually. That is possible because we know that for some vaccines that happens, like, like for influenza. But if it turns out that we can do longer, Mm -hmm. uh, then that, that will really be good news. But the studies are still going on, and um, we will have more evidence in terms of how long and how, how, how many more doses we need to have uh, uh, periodically to be able to keep us uh, protected. So, so that's a question that's really important, and I hope that we, we will be able to know more soon. So yeah. we, we keep waiting um, uh, uh, for the um, research that is coming out. But also Absolutely. part of the information that has clearly come out is, uh, out of those admissions that we've had, even people have gone up to the extent of uh, ICU, um, a, a section, and quite a big section of them, had been vaccinated already, either just one dose or even double doses. And one would ask, do the vaccines really work now? If I am saying, um, the medics are saying, vaccinate and then protect yourself against adverse effects. And then I'm having an admission and the people are going to ICU even after they've been vaccinated. That changes the whole perception about um, the efficacy of these vaccines. Um, it shouldn't necessarily change it because basically um, the, the vaccine moderates the severity of the disease. So we may have a few people end up in ICU, but they could actually have been more. Now, um, especially when we get newer variants uh, of the disease, as we've discussed earlier, some of them might be able to evade the protection that we've got from the vaccines. And you still get COVID, but at least it's moderated. The, the evidence shows that the, you know, the severity of the disease is still moderated and it's not as, as, as bad as it ought to have been. Now, what we see is that some of these newer variants spread faster. They are more transmissible. So you might end up with a much bigger population of people getting that disease. And because of that, 
you see as if there are more people being hospitalized, not because it's not working, okay. but because you have a big number of people infected. For example, if you had a thousand people infected and, and, and maybe 5% might end up going to hospital, you will end up with 50 people, right? Uh, 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 being, you know, ending up in the hospital. But what would happen if, on the other hand, you had 100,000 people infected? Mm. So you might say, oh, all of a sudden we have 500 people in the hospital, and that means the vaccines are not working. No, they are actually still working, but we just have a huge number of people that are infected. And how do we deal with that? Get more people vaccinated so that even when we have more people infected, uh, if they are not able to use other protective means, at least we moderate the proportion of people that will end up with severe disease. So yes, it does work, and it still remains one of the most critical tools that's going to help us so that we can get back to work okay. and, and maintain our livelihood. All right, thank you very much. In relation to the same, Dr. Sabrina, there have been reports of vaccinated children dying more than unvaccinated. How true could those reports be, and is there any connection to the reality that when I vaccinate my child, because the parents then would get worried, I, I risk losing them, maybe. Uh, and I'll, I'll let you know that I am a member of the COVAX facility committee, and which means I read a lot of literature and data regarding the vaccines and how they are working, not only here in Uganda, but globally. And the question you asked is actually not true. It's not true that more children who are vaccinated are dying because that literature is not there. Okay. So maybe it's one, of the, it's maybe one of the hoaxes and misinformation that are geared towards discouraging people from getting the vaccine. Mm. Mildred, the truth is um, when a dog bites a man, that's not news, <laughs> but when a man bites a dog, that is big news. Yes. And the people who are scaremongers, they deal with man bite dog kind of news, mm. which sometimes is ridiculous and it needs to be checked. And we are here to check that information. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and in relation just to the children, let me get to um, Dr. Annette. And I think you can break it down a little bit. Myocarditis in children, those have been reports that are particularly coming in. And how true are they? How can uh, someone be able to break down or decipher that sort of information? Okay, thank you very much. Now, when the Pfizer vaccine... So far, it's the only vaccine approved to be administered to children, children five years and above. And then 12 to 17 is both Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. Now, as many more children were being vaccinated, there's been an observation in a slight increase in the number of children who develop that myocarditis. It's basically some, uh, we call it an inflammation of the heart, heart mm -hmm. muscles. But... The good news, it is a very mild disease. The other good news is self-limiting. The other good news, of every 100 children who may develop that disease, 99.9% .9 improve. And the other good news, it is very, very rare. Can I repeat that? It is a very rare occurrence following vaccination. Okay. Now let us go back to the SARS-CoV-2 virus itself. Many of us who got infected with that virus did not have any heart disease. And I, and I can believe people who are listening to us this evening. But the moment they got that virus, they started manifesting some heart problems. Mm. And for every 100,000 clients who developed the COVID-19 disease, mm. 4,000 4, of them developed the heart problem. And now they even continue to on medication. Mm. But for the vaccine, as long as the mother brings that child early enough, immediately to the hospital. <clears throat> and what do we mean? If this child develops the following cardinal symptoms, eh? slight pain around the heart, previously mm. did not have it, post-vaccination. Mm. Slight increase in the heartbeat, slight difficulty in breathing, 
the mother or the caretaker should not remain at home. They should report immediately to the health facility, to the hospital, so that immediate treatment is provided to this child. All right, maybe, Dr. Net, just before you continue, like you said, yes, there is a lot of good news that you talked about, but you know many a times we want to say, yes. what if, for that small uh, percentage, that could be able to get the inflammatory cardiomyopathy that you talked about? What could be the cause? Is it that the child has an underlying issue, or what exactly could lead to it? Okay. Now, the studies are still ongoing. There are still assumptions. Is it a genetic component? Mm -hmm. Because there's still a new manifestation which has come out as we are rolling out the vaccines. So studies are still ongoing to tell us the actual cause. What could be the actual cause of this myocarditis, pericarditis, mm -hmm. which is occurring post-vaccination? Thoughts? Could be a genetic component. Secondly, is it an immune response following the vaccine? Not necessarily the components of the vaccine. So until we get that information, because the science is still ongoing, research is still ongoing, we will come back and tell the community that this is the likely cause of this myocarditis or pericarditis. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, this discussion is still on, and uh, just a disclaimer, uh, when we talk medical terms, I will still ask them to break it down, because not everyone who is listening is a medic or understands this uh, medical language, but sometimes, yes, that it, it, it becomes hard for doctors to break down their, you know, words, medical terminologies into layman's language, but we're trying as much as possible. Some of your questions and responses are coming in, and we promise to be able to pay attention to them. So let me hand you over to my colleague uh, Ben Winne to take us through part of the discussions that are coming through. Ben, you're smiling. I'm wondering what sort of conversations are there online. No, actually, I'm just picking up on what you said about knowledge of medical things because you said the word that I cannot pronounce, Kado <laughs> something, myopa something. I, it's okay, don't worry. I, I wouldn't even try doing <laughs> I'm a nurse's daughter, so don't worry. Oh, obviously, but of course, again, we are not scientists uh, for most yeah. of us, and we depend on the experts to give us the answers to the questions, and that's why we're here to try and get those answers for you, of course, as we talk about um, COVID vaccination, um, protecting you and your child, and we're saying say yes to vaccination, but of course also giving you an opportunity to ask any questions, which is why we're coming to you live from here at NBS 13 Summit View in Naguru, live on Urban TV, on Baba TV, and on Bukedi as well, and giving you an opportunity, especially on Twitter, for those of you who are on social media, to ask any questions that you might have and make sure that we get answers for them. The hashtags for you to use, vaccines work, COVID vaccination UG as well, you can be able to use those, and the questions will be coming to you. And we have lots of questions coming through, including one that is specifically for you, Professor Kadebo, because apparently the person says that you're a man, therefore they trust that you won't lie, yeah. as you can imagine. <laughs> uh, obviously, you know what this question is about. Yeah. Does COVID affect machines working? If you know, you know. Uh, so we'll, we'll come back to Professor Kadebo to tell us yeah. if, if, if the systems are still working on his side. Oh. Uh, I can tell you mine are. Um, this is someone coming saying that, uh, and, and I think it was asked by one of the panelists, we are hearing about the misinformers. We have a lot of misinformation coming out. Yeah. And for Dr. Atwini, what is the Ministry of Health going to do about these categories of misinformers and influencers who are putting a lot of people at risk by telling a lot of lies? We have questions. Uh, Leonard is asking about the short, short shelf life of vaccines and what that's all about and if it affects the you know people being a bit hesitant to use the vaccines. Um, someone is, is Cabrin, she's asking, we've been told about mutations, and I think Dr. Sabrina touched on this. Um, what, do we, what assurance do we have that the vaccines will be able to uh, work against many mutations that come? Michael Tsarimwa is asking, he's been vaccinated, he wants to know how come Africans have not been dying um, a, a lot, and especially in the villages, and how many boosters is one going to need to be safe? Um, this is coming in from you, Matthew Kagaula, and he says he wants to know, does nutrition have anything to do with whether a vaccine will work or not? We have a lot more questions coming uh, through. We'll pass them on to our panelists, and Mildred will put them before them. And if you have any more that haven't been asked yet, feel free to get in touch, of course, via Twitter. And, of course, we'll pass those on to our panelists. We'll take a very short break. We'll come back in just a bit and pick up on these discussions. The reminder for you, we're saying, say yes to vaccines. COVID-19 vaccination protects you and your children. Our hashtags to use, vaccines work, COVID vaccination UG. We will be right back. Uganda, are you ready? For the most exciting partnership of the year. Salah. Oh, what? 
Predator, the official energy drink of Liverpool FC. Available at 2,000 shillings. Predator, Sukuka. Sparkle Salon knows that good grooming is not an option in the modern world. It's a basic need. A need which we have for over two decades mastered provision of by building a great team of professionals and never compromising on the quality of our products. A need that we exist for and are very serious about. We want to give you the look that you desire. We have created great ambiences and convenience for our clients at all of our branches at Oasis Mall, Garden City, Lugogo Mall, Forest Mall, and Akasha Mall. Sparkle Salon, inspired by your needs. You know why Fanta goes really great with snacks? Because just like Fanta, snacking is colorful. Snacking isn't formal which means no knives and forks. You don't even need to book a table for snacking. In fact, you don't need a table at all. Snacking is comfy and playful. Snacking is a tasty treat. That's why snacking is colorful. Snack with Fanta. Get connected today with the My Airtel 4G smartphone and enjoy free data for one whole year worth 86,500 Uganda shillings. That's free 2GB for the first month and free 1GB for the next 11 months. At only 250,000 Uganda shillings with free data for one whole year worth 86,500 shillings making the effective price of the 4G phone 163,500 shillings only Airtel, the smartphone network Manyaga nge wampita na asasira Nicholas Zoku wangule ne gari na rindye yo mutuku saidi ze mutuku la Kula yoro kubumu nga nyagala nyueko Njira mpumbu la muko Nagendo kenda mkasa nikira Nisa nga mwe gari Evi rabo mwe vili Atesibi ya bulimba igari zeba jimpa deyino Enjoy as you win in the Twiga Teko promotion today Call toll free number 0800 299 008 And we'll deliver the prize to you Terms and conditions apply Enjoy longer lasting freshness with the new king size Movet Family Soap. Available in four exciting flavors and experience the rich texture of coconut, the natural herbal scent of alvera, the deeply sensation of lemon, and the silky smooth feel of rose. Get a fresh start for your family with the new king size Movet Family Soap. Available in all shops and supermarkets near you. Movet All Day Confidence. Sanyu senyo ni sanyu, e sanyu ligi wako unzita E mcheni momo teri imba hey. Na lindi waka, hmm. nye ndo kuli li simweze Nenga nye labi nebibi ya huli jevi ya chifere Kubanga, mbeda ha omu tunofu ne simu No gendo kuli lori hata andi sempa yemi tuwala hata no kakati chino E mcheni we yanku vide Bote vansa vya kuseto, weda baka banzi kakanya nabu kakanya Nze nga antabuse nga mamumuli bafiri hmm. Uze nandi wano presa za gara kumku babu kumbu Sine waka kuturo Ateke mumpa demo doka mubi ono nye Kati hata wiki indala Uda seba ka Emutieni yeba lenyo, okutufako, pengabe bule meziru wero. Baba lina waka, emutieni. Seven waka, with MTN Momo Nyabo. Simply deposit 20k or more on your mobile money for a chance with three Toyota Succeeds and money to 2,000 lucky winners every week. We're giving away 24 cars and over 2 billion shillings of mobile money.
The COVID-19 pandemic has never left, and with only 36% of the targeted, 70% of the eligible population at up-to-date vaccination status, our motherland's fate remains at stake. The misinformation, the distortions, and the disinformation around vaccination of Ugandans aged between 12 to 17 years have not helped matters either. This is all happening on the background of surging cases and the increased transmission, placing the country at the foot of the fourth wave. The good news is, it is not too late. The Ministry of Health, in conjunction with World Health Organization, on Wednesday, June 29, 2022, starting at 10 p.m., on NBS, UBC, Urban TV, and Baba TV, will broadcast a live town hall panel discussion by experts on vaccination science and disease control, alongside other influential national figures. Under the theme, COVID-19 vaccination protects you and your child. Say yes to vaccination. Follow the conversation on hashtag COVID vaccination. Welcome back. Thank you so much for keeping it uh, right here for this discussion. Broadcasting live on NBS television, uh, broadcasting live on UBC TV, Urban TV, as well as Baba Television. Thank you so much for joining us and continue streaming in your questions on the hashtags uh, vaccination UG as well as hashtag vaccines work. Hashtag COVID vaccination UG and hashtag vaccines work. Ben Winner is looking out for all your questions and will be definitely be uh, taking us through what they are still looking at vaccination where we are I will continue to say it's not a post COVID-19 era it's a post lockdown so COVID is still here and we need to protect ourselves lots of questions that have come through and I would like us to first of all take on those and I think I'll start with the very first one which requires the truth and nothing but the truth we're not going to have a Bible held here or a Quran but I believe that the truth is going to come out of personal experience. The message is about causing infertility. Ben said the machine stopping to work. You can just get that. A very interesting one. Somebody asked me that question. Okay. Yeah. And when I said we have no proof, yeah, scientifically we have no proof. And when I gave myself as an example, she was not convinced. <laughs> She was not convinced. And it was a she. And not yeah, yeah, yeah. She said, w w "How can we prove?" <laughs> so, so it's a, a, a difficult one. Uh, okay. Even if I told you, maybe here they will again ask more questions, yeah. which unfortunately will be very difficult. But the fact is, there is no evidence for that, uh, and we heard that this is real rumor going on in many parts of the country and scaring men. Yeah, scaring men. Uh, I was told if you, you say this vaccine causes what you have mentioned, even the old man of 80 will run away. Yeah. Yeah? So I think let's assure from what we have seen, what we have read, none of these vaccines, the different vaccines that we have, has led to impotence or okay. in, in, infertility. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I won't ask any more questions. I will not ask for you to prove. <laughs> Let me go to Dr. Diana Twine. On the people who are misinforming, and this is a lot of that information coming through, especially in this digital era. Um, uh, if you could just get your mic closer. I, I think Uganda is not exceptional. We have seen so many anti-vax sentiments, demonstrations, even, even in so many other countries. So the, the misinformation is part of, of our society, and, and um, our role is to continue... Um, providing facts to the public. But also, I, I want also to assure the public uh, that misinformation is actually against the law. It is a, a criminal offense. If actually we had very, very strong regulatory and, and enforcement uh, um, organs in this country, they would be able to hold people accountable. But I think for us as, as the sector, that's not our, our area of, of enforcement. Uh, for us, our, our job is to continue uh, providing information and, and, and demystifying all these lies like what we are doing right now. Yeah. Um, wh what I just want to assure the public is that science does not lie. Mm. Um, I think people who, who did not believe us when we told the public that COVID is here, is killing people, 
people did not believe at first yeah. they thought we were it was money making venture and that the first death announcement yes, yes. It was cooked um so but then later what we, we used to talk about they started experiencing this now when we told them that vaccines protect at first they they were hesitant but the people who got infection after even right now in our hospitals the people who are coming with severe infection i think 90 over 90% of the people who are coming in our hospital with severe disease and all those people we have lost for example in this wave mm. 99% are those that have not been vaccinated and so so when we tell the public that vaccination protects you from severe disease even when you get the infection you are protected your body is pre- is prepared to fight back that science you cannot you cannot fake um the fact so so we, our role really is to continue demystifying um providing the facts to the public and 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 this is this is continuous it's not going to stop now because if it's not only for covid you you find all these myths and 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 concoctions and and all that whatever because people just go on the on the social media and post anything disregarding the fact because they just had a neighbor say it and then they go ahead and post but i i i think we are, we are going to get to a level where for example we have got immunization act and in that immunization act actually provides penalties for misinforming the public oh, yes However right now because we we are still in the battle we are really in the middle of the battle we cannot have so many fronts to to start dealing and with all this with, no. and our our focus is very clear we continue to engage the public we continue to provide information and we continue to provide the service all right uh, dr roder i i think this one should go to you looking at the short shelf life of the vaccines and 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 one i think uh, was asking about how safe it is to take many more vaccines um because i'm looking at someone who vaccinated in march 2021 around july they're concluding the second one six months later it's a booster and then we're talking about more and more boosters is more more vaccination more protection or there is actually um a side effects that come with that i think that's a question that also came through Um so in terms of the shelf life um just like any other drug every drug and even the food we eat comes with a shelf life um uh, and it's written there and that's why we keep checking so really part of the system of maintaining this uh, vaccine uh, and its integrity is making sure that not only it's checked when it comes in but we also uh follow through and track under what conditions must it be kept and for how long mm-hmm. uh, so that it keeps okay and that's part of the system uh for for tracking so that the vaccines are safe and and we use uh good vaccines because beyond the you know the what is written there as the shelf life the conditions also do matter under which we keep it and that is part of the system for delivering uh the the vaccines so i think the public should trust that this system is in place uh the vaccines are received safely they are transported safely to wherever they are kept they are supposed to be refrigerated the temperatures are known for each of the vaccines and that is maintained and the shelf life is similarly maintained right now there are ongoing discussions that these vaccines could actually stay viable longer than we thought just like initially we thought you can't keep them below a certain temperature we can't manage yes. over time we realized as we learned more that we can actually use you know higher temperatures and we still survive So right now we are also realizing that they can actually last longer than we initially thought but trust that system that it will be reviewed by the WHO the experts will give us that information and if the shelf life is changed it will also be communicated but nobody is going to deliberately issue out a vaccine when it's beyond the recommended uh, shelf life the, the other in connection maybe is about the number of times earlier dr net of course was talking about side effects uh, because these are drugs So I am taking I've taken so far about four shots I'm I'm trying to imagine 
first second dose i have my booster and then there is another booster that is coming through mm -hmm. doesn't that have a side effect in my body so as long as you stick to what is recommended because whatever is being recommended now is informed by science how long will the protection last mm. and if we find that you need another booster after uh, another 6 months or 12 months then they are not only studying the boosting of the immunity but also studying is it safe so if we find that by adding more you're actually unsafe then we are going to be able to you know where the advice that we send out so because nobody wants to hurt anybody by issuing so many doses that they will make you unwell mm. so so that is part of the studies that we are looking at how long do you take before we give you more is it safe if we give you more and for now we know that there are several vaccines that you get repeatedly yeah. and we are safe like influenza so if it takes the same path, that is fine. But if it turns out that there is any issue, uh, if it's different from what we expect, then certainly we wouldn't recommend more doses. Okay. So again, let's trust that this is okay. It's based on science. Uh, but we do expect that that will not be a problem, that if you need to be boosted every year, that, that this will actually be a problem. But nevertheless, it will be studied. Yeah. We'll keep the trust. You know, they always say the doctor knows the drug. But that we shouldn't you take one too many. <laughs> we shouldn't again take too, too many, many yes. assuming that when I take many more, then I'm then better I'm protected. protected. Because once yeah. you take it outside the recommended schedule that we know is safe, mm -hmm. then we cannot guarantee that you'll be safe by taking many more. And in any case, even if it didn't hurt you, it's a waste. You're cheating somebody else. So it's not yeah. worth it. Thank you. I know Dr. Sabrina is also one who is very, very keen on matters, nutrition and health. There is a question that did come through on nutrition and whether it has any side effect on how that drug, that, that vaccine is, is going to work in your body. I remember the first vaccinations, you'd be told, please do not drink alcohol between a particular period of time. And, you know, I think that's where the question is as well emanating from. Should I eat particular things and not others when I'm vaccinated so I get the best utmost protection? Uh, thank you, Mildred. And I just have a rejoinder to what Professor Roda said, mm. that boosters are not something that is a guarantee that you will not fall sick. You need to give your body a chance for the immunity to build up. And also, stop being selfish. I know people who have gotten booster after booster after booster. Let's say first things first. Let everyone get at least the first shot yeah. and the second shot. Mm. Let children get vaccinated because they need to be vaccinated. And then we start struggling for the boosters. And the definition of booster is also going to change. Whereas for people who are immunocompromised, they are going to need three doses. For some people, they will need two doses. And then, like Professor said, the booster may be required maybe a year later or six months later. So watch the space. Watch the science. And just in terms of nutrition, we all need good nutrition. Mm. Whether you're going to get a vaccine or whether you're planning to get COVID because you're hanging out in a party without <laughs> a mask, okay. the primary issue is be, be ready okay. because safety comes to those who are prepared. For example, we used to sing a lot of, you know, don't, don't go out in the rain without an umbrella. In other words, don't go have unprotected sexual intercourse. Mm. I mean, so do not go to a party a large crowd when you're not vaccinated you will not feel safe you can't be sure about you won't be sure about your neighbor you don't know which party they were attending the night before mm. we are all safe here my assumption yes because we've been vaccinated we are boosted we are healthy our nutrition is on top of the game <laughs> okay <laughs> disclaimer. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much Dr. Sabrina. Mm -hmm. Dr. Annette uh, one also asked about whether now the mutations like Dr. Kalebo said, more and more mutations of the various uh, variants that come through and, and they're worried whether these vaccines that we have currently would also be able to apply to the new variants that are coming through every other day. Yeah and now currently the vaccines that have been approved by WHO, the 10 of them uh, can fight the current new strains that are coming up. Okay. And, but however, science is still ongoing. And uh, at the moment, they're trying to see if we could get that one vaccine, which can fight all the virus at once. Mm. 
Mm. And that is our wish, all of us. And probably if we get that one vaccine, but we don't know how many years from now, or it will be also a very short time of period. So basically, the current vaccines can, uh, can fight the current new strains that are already being developed. And, and the unfortunate thing, I would use the Omicron. It generated a daughter, now that daughter has also generated a granddaughter, a granddaughter also generating a grandson. Those sub sub survivors are also coming up. But the good news, the current vaccines can still fight all those many new strains that are coming up. Okay. Mm. All right, Professor Roda, I'd like to come to you a little bit. Mm. We are talking about vaccination, a good thing, mm. the positive messages. I've seen Dr. Diana Twino always talk about that. But we've also seen scientists who have come up against, you know, this whole COVID vaccination. We've also seen medics who are saying, me, I'll not get vaccinated. So if the medics are against it, if uh, they're saying we're not going to get vaccinated, mm. then me, a lay person, how will I trust Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so we have uh, we have that you know sometimes people raising genuine questions mm -hmm. um, uh, which can help us to search for more answers in science. That's okay and good we for science. We wouldn't expect the medics but, themselves. But sometimes we okay. also have uh, 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 medics. Um, human beings. Anyway. We, we are human <laughs> beings, Mildred. Uh, <laughs> we've we've had sometimes people say. I feel so bad when I see a doctor that over drinks. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I hope I, I, I hope we all won't go drinking because there are some medics that enjoy yes. uh, their drink, or there are some medics that smoke, yeah. even when we say it's not right to smoke. Yes. So, so I think sometimes we also do have our own behavior mm. uh, uh, that that we fail to manage, but sometimes also we we are human beings and we do have our own fears, and and because they know that. There might be the 0 0.05% <laughs> um, and, and even when they know that the risk of the disease might be worse than the vaccine, the figures that Annette shared, some medics also get overridden by fears. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we also do have people, the misinformers we talked about, that like to wear our coats <laughs> and they do this uh, TikTok. Mm. Mm -hmm. and, and then they begin to send us so many doctors and, and they like to introduce themselves in a very sophisticated way. Mm. Uh, they are virologists, they are, they are experts, they have been working with a vaccine company and, and, and all sorts of things. So sometimes they sound so credible and, and they create a lot of challenges for us. But the bottom line is we prayed for these vaccines, Mildred. In the sure. first lockdown, sure. when we got the Delta variant and many of our relatives and friends were dying, we all said, when can we have this vaccine? Yeah. Now it's here, but human nature is complex. We are now fighting the vaccine, which is really the best tool for keeping us outdoors and working. Yeah. So I would really appeal to the public that let's go and get vaccinated. Let's make good use of this chance so that we can stay active and have a livelihood. That's true. Dr. Atwine, um, vaccination in itself requires, because this is not a drug that I'm picking off the shelf and then I will just administer like capsules or whatever it is. It requires a particular way of storage. It requires a particular way of transmission. And one is asking, how different are you going to deal with the drive of vaccination this time around? Looking at what you said, those who have done full vaccination are only slightly below 60% or even less than 50%. Those, those who have done double vaccination, how different is the ministry going to handle this vaccination drive this time? Are you going to find us in the bars? Are you going to find us at the churches? How different will it be for you to impact on more people? Um, first of all, I want to assure the public that Ministry of Health has built capacity in terms of cold chain to ensure that all our vaccines throughout the country are transported and stored uh, according to the temperatures that, that, that keep the integrity of the vaccines. We have also organized, um, like last time, how we organized the campaigns. We are going to use all different um, methods. Okay. We, we are going to, uh, our teams are, are going to go out to the, the communities, uh, but also we have vaccines at the facilities, so people can, can feel free to go to the facilities and get vaccinated. But those that are not able, they, they make use of, of the teams that are in the community to make sure that 
uh, they, they reach out to 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 these teams that that go in the in the villages to to make sure that they get vaccinated but also we'll want to use all other ways like you know the market days the the churches if 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 really um we see that the the uptake is is slow we are going to use all ways to make sure that we, we get to people because we really we, we have a lot of vaccines in our country mm. and it will be really shameful to to have all these vaccines stay and until they expire yet we still have a big population that that, that requires uh, these vaccines okay. so we are available this whole week we are there but also these vaccines are going to 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 be at, at our facilities to make sure that uh, those that are missing the communities they they are free to to go to any any of our, our facilities in in the districts and and in towns to make sure that they they get vaccinated all right professor but Kareem. but there there is also something there was a question that africans are da dying are, they are dying less eh? we have that, that, that they are not dying sorry it's not true that really the also <clears throat> our people died except mm -hmm. that they are not dying in the numbers that we are seeing in some countries there there are possibilities that that first of all um our, our african population we still have a big number of, of young population compared to 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 to, to mm -hmm. the those developed countries mm -hmm. um that also could have contributed because the, the older the age the higher the uh, was the, the risk existent, yeah. but also the lifestyle of the developed countries you know these are these are crowding these are urbanized largely urbanized um if you look in in, in africa uh, the countries like south africa like egypt like morocco that that is more or less like the lifestyle is like western countries they 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 had quite a huge number of 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 deaths because of the crowding because of highly urbanized and 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 the lifestyle because they were using trains they were using all the, all these things that were putting all the, you know the the crowds together but but when you look in our setup like here in Uganda our our big population is is rural but also is young population the lifestyle is not and and, and, and that time. but also i i think we learned um we learned from the first countries that got the, the, the experience like us like mm. italy like all those countries so uh, like in uganda here i know that our public intervention public health interventions that that we instituted as early as as, as the beginning although we are being abused it really helped also to 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 reverse uh, the, the number of deaths okay. so it's possible yes yes the numbers are not as as bad as in europe or in, in america but still we we, we lost Thought quite so. a, a number of people so let's not just thump about our ancestors <laughs> at this point in time at least <laughs> professor kalebo um is there any kind of um what one would call a basis for which vaccine i take and 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 many are asking this in relation to for example if 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 it is choice of a family planning method um the doctor will take you through you know for this family planning method if you've had this and this this is a hormonal this is non hormonal is it the same because we have a number of vaccines available or I, it's it's by choice i can come and tell you i want johnson and johnson or is it by what's available is there any kind of science relating to um looking at history or whatever medical condition for which vaccine one takes most of the vaccines that have been used like we have seen it in Uganda people can have different choices yeah uh, the astrazeneca some people have got astrazeneca when we got johnson people started using johnson johnson when we had pfizer people started using pfizer at least a general can see say that uh, and the choice of a vaccine can be used by the population mm. yeah uh, of course uh, there uh, uh, we know that uh, uh, some the performance of these vaccines is not exactly the same uh, some have proven to be a little bit uh, have more uh, protection than uh, than the others but it generally the good thing all these vaccines are helping us especially from getting severe disease and hospitalization so the vaccines are, are working very well the one uh, uh, at least uh, uh, what we have talked about about children 
Mm. For children, we are saying the evidence we have is Pfizer. Yeah. Okay. For those, the young ones, although for the uh, slightly older uh, children, Moderna also has, uh, has been used. And the reason mostly for now, that's where we have evidence. Yeah, that's where we have evidence. The Chinese vaccine also they're telling us can be used in children, but we haven't yet seen the data. When the data, if it, if it is available, then this vaccine also could be also available uh, for, for the children. Otherwise, like Mildred, I think the choice is wide. Yes. <laughs> the choice is quite wide. All right. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I, I know Ben is scrolling through his phone as much, trying to get all the questions that are coming through. And in the next few minutes as well, I'll be getting back to him uh, to see if we have uh, some more questions directed to the panelist right here. You can feel free to ask your question directed to a particular panelist, or you could ask it generally. All these are medical practitioners, and they will be uh, able to answer all your questions as they do come through. I want to come to you, Dr. Annette. There were reports of um, a teenager who was admitted at Chirudu Hospital um, with multiple organ failure, and the, the discussion around it is it was caused by COVID vaccination. How true is that, and what more information has actually come through with, the, with regard to that case? Now, I would like to mention at this point in time that investigations are still ongoing. Okay to determine the actual cause of the current condition of this young child. So once the final investigations have been completed, the Minister of Health will officially uh, provide the information to the public. And these investigations basically include the laboratory, plus also another team of experts are also reviewing this young child so that they can come up with a comprehensive picture of what is currently happening in this young boy. And finally, that boy is undergoing treatment at Churudu, which is a government facility. So we hope that by within the next couple of weeks, because some of the tests have to be done outside the Uganda, mm. okay? <clears throat> so once we get that, uh, for those final results, then the Ministry of Health will come back and tell the public what, is the, what, what caused that problem with this young child. Okay. We earlier on as well, uh, Dr. Annette, before I leave, you talked about myocarditis in children, but how about blood clotting? Has there been any sort of research with regard to vaccination and clotting? Because that was the biggest news, and this time it didn't come from Uganda. <laughs> it came from the Western world. Yeah, I remember the clotting disease. Let me use the clotting disease around April, May. Yeah when we started using the AstraZeneca in this country, but of course the reports had already been um, coming out from the European, from Europe and also the American. Now what I want to inform the public is that yes, the clots have, been, the blood, I would call it the clotting disease, has been documented as one of the rare, let me use the word, very rare side effect following the AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson disease. But the other issue what people should know is the presentation, mm. the way the, the client presents, it is similar to another disease, an autoimmune disease, which occurs even without the vaccine. And these hematologists who are basically experts in blood disease, okay, in the blood disorders, say, wait a minute, even that autoimmune disease, when it occurs, it can be managed as long as the client appears early for treatment. So even this clotting disease, if it occurs, this client can be managed. And the key symptoms which I would like to mention to the public so that they don't stay at home and take traditional herbs and uh, use chisepichi. Mm -hmm. If there's any acute sudden pain, severe pain anywhere, it can be in the abdomen, of course in the stomach, or in the chest, or in the lower limbs, this person should report immediately to the health facility okay. so that <coughs> adequate and proper treatment is provided. In Uganda, we've not yet got such cases. Okay. Okay? And uh, we are still monitoring. So that's why I want to encourage everyone to report. They should not remain behind and then they start producing rumors. But it's a very rare, rare occurrence. If I can give the figures, it is one out of the 250,000 clients who received the vaccine, one of them may develop that rare condition, that rare okay. side effect, 
which is also being monitored. And finally, we have a global <coughs> vaccine safety committee under WHO, which receives all these reports from all over the world. And they're gathering all this information. And they say, no, wait a minute. Still the benefits outweigh, outweigh the risks. So that's why we continued using the AstraZeneca and we've continued using the Johnson & Johnson. We are now happy because many of us have got infected with the Omicron during this time. Because we are vaccinated, but we are not admitted. Yeah. And yet we receive the AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson. So the benefits of the AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson still outweigh the risks of the clotting disease. Okay. Someone out there is saying every other time they're going for vaccination, they say a prayer so that they don't become that one <laughs> <laughs> out of the so many who could have the adverse yes. side effect. Just before we go to our questions, there has been this intriguing question, and I'm coming to you, Dr. Diana, of but where did COVID come from? Because it was a discussion. Yes, we know it was from China, Wuhan province particularly, but even a world leader going ahead to say, it was manufactured in a lab somewhere. And, and there's so many people who have taken up this sort of discussion. And let, let, let's break down to the science. Like you said, science does not lie. What has the science shown? We, we, we shall always um, continue to... Is, is my oh, mic on? Okay, yeah. mm. um, we shall always continue to hear all these theories. Remember even HIV, there, there, there were so many theories. Even this one, um, what, what we know right now, there are two school of thoughts. Okay. The first one is that this virus was existing. Remember that even before there was SARS, mm. SARS, SARS infection, and mm. especially in, 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 in China, and, but also there could have been the virus like a cousin of the original SARS that was or, or like in animals, was t but not causing disease. Mm. But then, for some reason, there, there, there was that, that barrier that was broken where the, vira, the, the virus was and it crossed to human, and then it, it started causing disease. But also, we, 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 there is also a, a, a thinking that Yes, this virus was, was in, uh, uh, habit, habiting in, in animals, safe there, not causing diseases, and did not cross. But then some, some people could have obtained this virus, manipulated it in the lab to test, and then maybe through the mistake, and mm. it just went out of control. Mm. So really, we don't have the, the, the facts clear, because okay. we have had all sorts of, of theories, so it would not be very right for us to, to, to speculate, to because to we, particular... we really we don't have the, the facts. At least what the facts that we do have is that vaccines are safe, and you can yes. be able to take them, and they went through the right scientific uh, steps to be able to get produced and certified by the World Health Organization. I would ask once again, have you been vaccinated yourself? Have you taken your second job? Have you taken uh, your booster as well? More questions that are streaming in uh, using our hashtags, COVID vaccination UG, and hashtag vaccines work. Ben, any more questions that are coming through? Yes, that we need have. A lot of um, truth telling. Eh? Okay. Tons and tons of questions, actually, Mildred. Thank you. Okay. Um, and uh, please do keep them coming. You know, our hashtags uh, vaccines work, COVID vaccination, UG, our uh, other hashtag in case you want to get in touch and have any specific questions for us. Uh, wherever you're watching us, whether it's on uh, UBC, on Baba, on Bukede, or right here on NBS TV, so please do go ahead and share those. Uh, some very um, relevant questions as well, especially for um, our panelists here. This is um, around the issue of vaccination for children. There's a couple of questions around this. Okay. Um, one being about consent. We, we've been talking about that. Dr. Sabrina has shed some light on that, but some worker here is asking, what happens where one parent consents to a child being vaccinated and the other parent does not? Um, how do we deal with that? And then also another one, person was asking, um, as an adolescent child um, who refuses to be vaccinated, yet they are still legally under the guardianship of their parents, how does that get managed? Um, Edwin Chironde is asking, why are we making such a fuss over vaccinating children 
Yet, statistics show that the survival rate is more than 99% for those between 0 and 18 years of age. And then a bit more specific to the logistics, um, someone is asking, they, they were not very nice, to be honest, in the message they sent out to the Ministry of Health. They are saying, why aren't they not getting their vaccination um, certificate yet? So yes. that's something to deal with. Then some more questions. This is Arafat Maganda has got a couple of questions. To you, Dr. Kalebo, um, can I cut corners? Can I be able to just jump to the booster doors instead of, uh, you know, <laughs> taking the first, the first one and, and second shot? Will I still be safe if I just, you know, go, go to the... To the, to the booster doors directly. <laughs> uh, and for uh, our Madame P.S., Dr. Atwine, um, some people in Uganda seem to be skeptical of vaccines coming from other countries for obvious reasons. Like you said, everyone has their own <laughs> theories. Uh, when do we expect to get the Ugandan vaccine that hmm. we've been hearing about? Maybe that will help with the uptake for that. And for you, Dr. Sabrina, about the children again, uh, do we have any statistics or facts on what age a child is able to contract the virus from when they are an infant. So these are some of the questions coming through so far. Please keep them coming. We'll pass them on to our panel. Of course, you can continue asking them online. We'll be able to get um, answers for you. Our hashtags, vaccine, vaccines work, and hashtag COVID vaccination UG. So we'll hand it back to Mildred to get some answers for you. All right. Thank you very much, Ben, for that and the questions that are coming through. I think I'll start with the questions that were more and those were to Dr. Sabrina, especially about children. So take up those, especially starting with at what age can a child contract um, COVID-19? I will give testimony. My son contracted COVID at 11 months. So, but you can take it up. Uh, sorry about your son. Hopefully he did not he did get recover long COVID. And he, was, uh, he doesn't have long covid not at all. Thank God. We thank God. Yeah. I saw a nine-day-old baby who got COVID-19, and sadly, we lost that baby. And for me, that is the pain that we went through as doctors who take care of children. In the Delta wave, mm -hmm. as mothers were giving birth to their babies, and they had COVID, and their babies were born, and those babies got COVID, and some of them died. Yeah. That is the pain we are talking about. Yeah. That is the pain that we pushed for pregnant women to get their vaccines and not die so that they could be saving the baby and letting the mother die. Yeah. And we have moved a long <clears throat> way. So for me, when people say, oh, it's just a fuss, don't vaccinate children, I think you're not being very sensitive. Even if one child dies out of the 17 million children in this country, that is a big loss. Yeah. Children are our future, and we know very well that 55% of our population is less than 18 years. We had all this fear and halabaloo when children were sent home, and they went home with COVID and got their grandparents sick and got their parents sick. And some of those parents died. Those children were not vaccinated. So, dear friends, don't <clears throat> take this lightly. This is not a joke. This is not a fuss. This is protection for everyone. And if it works for the adults, why are we leaving out safety for the children? For me, that is the big question. For parents who disagree, that is an unfortunate event. But I'd like to urge parents, let's communicate. Parents do communicate with each other. At the end of the day, you want your child to be safe. I told you, my children, the youngest of whom is 16, is one of those people who have been vaccinated. And you will know from the Ministry of Health that 317 children aged between 12 and 18 have been vaccinated. Oh. My husband and I were very comfortable to send our children to school because they were vaccinated. Yeah. And so parents out there, do not take this lightly. I hope you remember that your children too have the right to be vaccinated. <clears throat> On the question of the adolescent who will refuse to be vaccinated, it is entirely their choice. You cannot force a cow to drink when you take the cow to, to the well. Mm. And, and just to give you an example, today I prescribed 
HPV vaccination, tetanus and diphtheria vaccine for a 14-year-old, and she got to the nurse and she said, I don't feel like getting vaccinated today because I'm already in pain. I'm having a period. Hmm. Hmm. And we totally respected her choice for the moment. But she'll think about it and come back. And come back. Yeah. There's no forcing for vaccination. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Diana Twine, issues of Ugandan vaccines and um, the online certificates that people were saying, we got vaccinated, the certificates are not coming. How will we even be able to prove that we are vaccinated? Um, we, we have these certificates generated. They are auto-generated in our system. Uh, shortly, I'm going to give you the link that you run on, on the screen uh, so that the, 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 the public... We, even we issued, the, 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 the director of public health issued a statement and guiding on, on, on how to access that, and we put it out on our website, on our, uh, on, on our Twitter handle. But we, we, are, we are going to give it to you so that you keep on running. So whoever wants to, to ac access the, the, the certificate can, can go into that link and enter the, the details, mm. the particulars of, of the, the person, the, the, the date, the birth date, and then we can, um, the, the, the person can get the information. In case the information is not updated, because remember that at first, we are using manual records, yes. so you'll find that maybe in some areas, depending on where they, they got vaccinated from, maybe all, all the data was not captured. But in case that information is, is missing, still it can be updated and that certificate is, is, is generated. Okay. So we shall, we shall share with you the, the link. Okay. Yeah. And, and maybe still on, on that, there are those who are complaining about wrong data or wrong information, for example, wrong names, how can they be able to correct up such mishaps? It is, it is still possible that uh, if they find um, the information missing or mis miswritten, um, they, they can still contact our call center and, 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 and that information can be updated in the system and they will be able to get the the, the, the right certificates. Okay, the other question was about the Ugandan vaccine uh, that the president has continuously talked about. We've heard the scientists talk about that. Um, I, I don't know if you're comfortable talking about that as well. That's a question. That um, the, the vaccine is still uh, undergoing all those preclinical um, uh, studies, and I'm glad uh, uh, Professor Pontiano is here with me, who, who has been also participating. Yes. Uh, I don't have the current um, information, but maybe if he well, has some, some information, please uh, let us know. All right. <clears throat> yes, just to remind, there are three types of vaccines our science are working on. Uh, one we call a subunit uh, vaccine, which is, uses recombinant proteins, and our coll colleagues in Makere are working on that. Uh, at Uganda Virus Research Institute, uh, my colleagues are working on two types of vaccines. One is inactivated, where you grow the virus. They did grow the virus, inactivated. Uh, and then the other one is using a vector. Again, colleagues have uh, developed a, a, a vaccine uh, that uses a chimp, another chimp, uh, adeno, like the AstraZeneca. But this is a different adeno virus. They are still in the lab. The next step will be to go to uh, animal mice studies, and that will be done in collaboration with the colleagues at Makerere uh, University, uh, COVAB, uh, and uh, the discussions are now really to start. Uh, for some, at least the products uh, at uh, the Uganda Virus Institute is to discuss how they move into the, uh, uh, the small animals. So we are still in those early stages of the lab and going to... Uh, the small animals. Okay. One asked about uh, skipping uh, and going yeah, yeah, yeah. Skipping, to the booster. Yes, skipping. <laughs> Maybe we just need to know what is a boost and what is a prime. Because we yes. talk about the first dose yes. as a prime and the second dose as a boost. Yeah. So what means the first dose, it is priming the immune system. Yeah. Switching it off, on. Switching it on. So that is the priming. And then later you give a boost to stimulate more. It's like the word in English, boosting. 
So, so if you skip the primer and you say you are getting a boost, actually you're not boosting. That one where <laughs> you you're getting started. is a prime. <laughs> you have just uh, you have just started. Yes. So you, there must be something you boost. If you say, "Oh, I've skipped," now, I don't know how he does it. Does he say now today? <laughs> let me think about I'm priming. And then when I go there now, I've boosted. I am boosted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, 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 Short yeah. That's why they don't want to drive straight. They always want to jump over. So they oh, think there is no shortcut with vaccination. The vaccine shortcut will be the first cut. <laughs> yeah. Somebody can stay, stop at priming yeah. if you don't go for the, the other dose. Yeah. But you will not boost yourself when you don't have what to boost. <laughs> so it, it must be something to boost. <laughs> Sorry for whoever is planning to shortcut. Mm. There is no shortcut in vaccination. Uh, maybe Professor Roda and uh, Dr. Annette can as well uh, share some insights on some of the questions that did come through. Dr. Annette, let me start with you. Unless the client is planning to take water for injection <laughs> as a first dose. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, but of course you can't um, skip. Yeah. You have to start, as already uh, um, mentioned, the first dose, second dose, following what the science is telling us. Mm. And I don't know why. We should not fear. Really, we should yeah. not fear. We are now celebrating. We are now comfortably. You can move around without putting on a mask if you're in an open space. Yeah. Okay? And now the health workers are happy. There are very, very few cases. And unfortunately, those admitted cases are the ones, probably the ones who have skipped the vaccination. Mm. Okay, they are not yet vaccinated. Because <clears throat> it will be very painful, the vaccines are available now, and then someone gets infected with a SARS-CoV-2 virus. So I just kindly encourage people, let them access the right information so that they can be able to answer all their questions, and then mm. they can start the, the recommended schedule to be fully vaccinated against the COVID-19. All right. Dr. Roda, any supplement to some of the questions that did come through? To emphasize is that whatever we fear out there to the viewers, whatever side effects, whether we are talking the inflammation of the heart, whether you're, cause, you're fearing clots, mm. just remember that COVID causes the same and much more. The risk of you getting the clots, the risk of you getting the inflammation when you get COVID is so much higher. So if you fear and you want to protect your heart or you want to get away from the clots, get vaccinated. It's safer than trying it okay. uh, with, with, with uh, uh, the disease. The, the other issue I would like to say is that we do have a responsibility to protect one another. The more people are vaccinated out there, the better we are, all of us. If you don't, then you remain the vehicle for carrying, again, the infection uh, into other uh, people within the population, especially those that are not vaccinated. So it is a responsibility to ourselves as individuals, but also a responsibility to the community. Okay, thank you very much. Our time is really running out and I feel like the discussion has just started. But uh, Dr. Diana, one particular, you, you promised as government that you didn't want to engage private sector in vaccination first because you needed a greater percentage of Ugandans to be vaccinated and not taken advantage of, like we saw those exorbitant bills for COVID treatment. Um, how far now with um, involving the private players in? Because I'll be like, I, I don't want to go to a health facility. I want to call my doctor, book up, go to the health facility, private facility, and get my dose. Um, yes, at the beginning, we were very cautious because we didn't want to let the vaccines in the hands of everyone. First of all, it is very necessary that to have these vaccines, you must have proper cold chain. And so many of, of, of the private facilities at that time were not prepared. But also to avoid um, this kind of, of, uh, of, of, of misconception that uh, because the, the private would definitely charge a certain fee mm. uh, to, to pay for, for, for their uh, overhead costs. But then the, the, the public would somehow misinterpret that, uh, that they are selling the vaccine. But also we didn't want for the, 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 the private sector to take advantage of the population. 
Yeah, since that time, you know, everyone was very, very desperate for, for the vaccine, and so we, we, we didn't want to, to take any advantage of, of I mean, to, to take any risk for our population to, take in, to be taken advantage of. But right now we, we are opening up. So the, the, the private sector that, that is ready to, to have these vaccines, like recently the, the, the Prime Minister um, opened um, the vaccine access initiative yes. uh, where they, they, they have set up very good facility with very good cold chain um, system. So once we, we, you, you come to us and tell us that you are ready to, to have the vaccines, and you, you, you have um, what it takes to store and, and, and manage the vaccines very well, I think we would, would, would be very, very willing to work with the private sector okay. because we have always worked with the private sector for even for other diseases. They, 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 the private sector has been vaccinating children. Yes. Um, we, we, we work with them, we give them vaccines, and they, and, and they reach out to the, the, the children and vaccinate. So... We do believe that we've got to that level where um, once the private sector is prepared and, and has the, 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 the requisite for, for, for them handling the vaccines properly, we'll definitely give them the vaccines. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Our time is first spent, ladies and gentlemen. I'm wondering from Ben Winnie whether there is any more questions that are coming through. We just take on those and then we can be able to, um, we'll be able to take on our closing remarks from our panelists. Ben, any more questions coming through? Uh, we do have a lot, uh, many questions actually coming through, though um, we do have some information on uh, how people can get their certificates at uh, the PSO was talking about. We have a toll-free line for them to be able to access. You can call 0800-100-066. That's 0800-100-066. But also, in case they need to be able to access that vaccination certificate, you go to the website, epivac.health.go.ug forward slash certificates. That's epivac, E-P-I-V-A-C dot health dot G-O dot U-G forward slash uh, certificates and this is very important because if you are on Twitter you probably would have seen and you follow the Ministry of Health uh, Twitter handle you might have seen the stats that uh, Dr. Atune did share at the beginning of our town hall today um, 88 new cases confirmed um, earlier today Mildred um, which is not very good especially considering the fact that they are spread across the country in Kampala 60 of them 10 in Rubidizi 8 in Wakiso, 4 in Mbarara, 4 in Jinja, uh, who are following us on Baba TV, 1 in Mbale and 1 in Chochera. So obviously there is some concern about this uh, sort of uh, going across the country and us needing to be a bit more vigilant in terms of what we do, which is why we are saying vaccines work, COVID vaccinations UG, and that they protect you and your children. And you might want to think about making sure that you go and get those doses, Mildred. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ben, for that. And for all of those who ask the questions, let them continue streaming through. Uh, tag at Ministry of Health. And uh, some of the questions that could not have gotten answered here will as well be answered. Looking at my watch, uh, the time is first spent, but we need to be able to conclude this. And as we do, I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Annette, uh, to give us your closing remarks. But also there is a question that did come through about um, the investigation report about a one Miss Charikunda Rosette earlier on in the vaccination stage, a medical student from Bositema University reportedly died soon after COVID vaccination. Any information that did come through in that regard? And then also, please, uh, you can give us your closing remarks. Okay, I thank you very much. Quickly, uh, unfortunately, Rosette died from cerebral malaria. Okay. Yeah, because all deaths following vaccination, as long as the caretakers raise a concern, that the cause of death is vaccination, we do a post-mortem. So a team of pathologists did the post-mortem, and what we found out was, unfortunately, cerebral malaria. And we know we can manage cerebral malaria in this country. Mm. So that is why now my closing remarks, that the Minister of Health is closely monitoring all medical concerns. Let me use the word medical concerns, mm. not even side effects. As long as any client has a concern following vaccination, please report immediately. First of all, 
to the health facility to get proper treatment, and then secondly to the National Drug Authority so that they can take note of that medical concern. And then we move to the next step of carrying out a detailed investigation. Please do not remain at home when you have any medical concern following vaccination. Come and report to us so that by the end of the day, we are able to tell the entire world that look here, all these medical concerns are not at all related to the vaccination. Or what you've reported has already been seen elsewhere. And it is mild. Within a few hours, a few days, it will be resolved and then you go back to your normal life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Sabrina, what would you be your parting shots? Parting shots include a clarification. Yes. Some people have thought that it's 100 children who died. It is yes. not 100 children who died. It's mm. 100 children who are admitted, who are critically ill in various regional hospitals. Mm. And out of those, 10 died. Oh. Okay. But um, I'm very grateful, first of all, to you, Mildred, for, you know, being a great moderator and Thank to you. NBS and all the partners and to all the people who are participating in this conversation, let us continue this conversation. Our children are not safe until they are vaccinated, yeah. and we are not safe until we are all safe. So let us get our vaccines. For those of you who have got your first shot, second shot, do get your booster. Do not jump. You cannot get only booster. Get the primer, the booster, and another booster. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roda. Over to you. So, a, a, a critical issue for me is that we've come a long way from having just masks and being tucked away in our homes and not being able to do the things that we love. Hmm. We now have an opportunity. For and it is Mr. Makeup being, you know, shown For out. me to be <laughs> here today without a mask yeah. is a privilege. I, I feel I can't afford to lose. I don't know what you really love out there that you want to continue doing. The hmm. vaccines are an opportunity for us to have that livelihood back once again. But unfortunately, if we have so many unvaccinated people it leaves many of us exposed. It's our responsibility. So for those who are listening, please do talk to people, convince others to be able to come forward and vaccinate. And the side effects that we fear are even more if we don't vaccinate. So let's step forward and do this so that we can avoid another lockdown yeah. and have our livelihood back. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I will first cross to Professor Kalebu here with your concluding remarks. I think, uh, thank you, Mildred, and the uh, uh, NBS uh, for hosting us. But I think I want to emphasize safety is very important to everyone, including the manufacturers of these vaccines. There is high liability, so safety is so important. At the start, we used to read other countries, but it's very good, as you have heard, even in our country, we're beginning to generate data about the safety of these vaccines, which is very important. And that brings me to the point of if people suspect somebody has died or has an effect because of a vaccine, let's go to the right people so that we can at least record that, or if people have died, do a post-mortem. The many people we talk about, some so-and-so was vaccinated, then afterwards passed away. I've had many who are saying that, some I know. It's very difficult unless you have done real post-mortem all the doctors have clearly said. Otherwise, it remains rumor, rumor mongering. Yeah. No yeah. facts. So let's use science. <laughs> As the PS says, science does not deceive. Yeah. We best we have we are here. We have survived mostly because of science. So help us. If there are any issues, safety of the vaccine, do report. If people die, have the opportunity. If possible, postmortems are, die, are done. We have seen that many people have passed away after vaccinations. Postmortems show they have died of something else. So let's do, uh, do that. But safety is a concern of everyone, all of us. All right. Thank you very much. Dr. Atwine, as you conclude, uh, I want Derek Atwine was asking, the reason he has failed to get his second job because he lost his card, can never f remember where the card is, but whenever he goes, he's asked for the card. So what does he do at that? Um, and then we, 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 to we can case. still vaccinate and then uh, go into the system and, 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 and generate a fresh, if, if we misplaced. 
um, the, the, the card. Okay. That information is available in our system. Okay. Um, as we conclude, first of all, I want to thank the partners and, and all of you that hosted us to, to, to make sure that we are able to reach as many people to, uh, to, to give them this information. One thing I wanted to, to emphasize today as we conclude this talk show is that the responsibility of our lives lie with us individually. The decision that we make can keep us safe or can endanger us. Yeah. So the, respons the sole responsibility of our lives lie with us. The second thing I wanted also to emphasize is that science is not witchcraft. We are not witch doctors here. <laughs> For us, we talk about... Yeah, doctors, not witch yes, doctors. Yes, we, we talk with facts and statistics. So when we do clinical trials, when we follow through what other clinical trials that have been conducted, are the, it is the basis for our decisions. We don't gamble. We would not take our children to get vaccinated if we, be, we are doctors. Mm. We, we have studied the science. We know exactly what is happening. We have even studied the statistics and the articles that have been published in the peer journal, uh, the, the journals globally. And therefore, we know what exactly is taking place and what is being done. We would not entrust our children to go to get vaccinated if we believed that they were not safe. So because we did that, we totally trust that the, the processes to, to, for clinical trials to ensure that the safety, the science is right, the processes are right, and therefore our children are safer vaccinated than risking them to get infection when you do not, you cannot predict whether my child would be one of the ten that will die or get severe disease and heal with effects. Because even when you get severe disease and you heal, there is certain effect on your health because the lungs you heal with fibrosis scars in the heart and then later you can get actually complications so we don't want to get there lastly the vaccination also has a protective not just to moderate the the the, the impact of our bodies towards the infection but also it lowers the virus in the body that i i have less chance of infecting people here because my viral load will be very low because the, the, once I'm, I'm, I'm vaccinated, the body starts making antibodies and when I get infection, the, the soldiers in the body are able to attack immediately the viruses. Therefore, the, virus, the viral load in my system, in my airway system, is, is a little less. Therefore, there is even a higher chance that I will have someone in this room and I will not infect you because of the, the, the vaccination. So it is not just to protect me from severe disease, but also to protect the person I'm with next. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We would love to continue with this, but we do promise that there will probably be a next time for this. Thank you, Dr. Annette, for your time. Two days of discussion. If you're doubting that, we started this yesterday on Wednesday. It's already Thursday. Thank you very much, Dr. Sabrina, Dr. Roda, for coming through, Dr. Diana Twine, and Dr. Pontiano Kalebo. And to UBC TV, Urban TV, as well as Baba TV and NBS Television for broadcasting this and getting all this information information to the Ugandans. To my colleague Ben Winne who dealt with all your questions coming through, I want to say thank you and to the entire crews of all the televisions who have been broadcasting this. We come to an end. My name is Mildred Tuhaisa. I will say good morning and God bless you. The COVID-19 pandemic has never left and with only 36% of the targeted, 70% of the eligible population at up-to-date vaccination status, our motherland's fate remains.